This next theorem that I've got up on the board is given in your text. It's called the squeeze theorem. Now in your text, it's given as theorem three. Don't need to know that it's theorem three. You should know the name squeeze theorem. In fact, as a short answer question on an exam or a quiz, I might ask you to simply state it. And this is what it states. Now the squeeze theorem has the form that a lot of math theorems have. It's an if-then statement. So an if-then statement says if, and then it gives us some conditions. And it says if these conditions are satisfied, then this result will be true. Okay. For those of you in the honors section, we're going to be spending a decent amount of time proving various things. All of us will spend a little bit of time working on proofs in the next section. So we will talk then about how to prove an if-then statement. Okay, but for the most part, unless you're in the honor section, most of the theorems that we have this semester are going to be given to us as true. The mathematicians that have gone before have said so, and we can use their wisdom and their knowledge to just say, hey, I know this is true, and we'll be using the theorems. And to use it, what you need to do is say, hey, the mathematicians have told me if these conditions are satisfied, I get this result. So you would simply show that the conditions are satisfied. You would demonstrate that. And then you get to conclude your result. Now let's see, what are our conditions here? Okay, So we've got to have this inequality. So we're going to have f of x less than or equal to g of x less than or equal to h of x. And when I have an inequality, I can essentially apply the, the limit to that inequality. That's what the last theorem said, that if I've got an inequality and I'm in a situation where limits exist, okay, and notice our second condition is going to tell us something about the existence of limits, okay, but if I've got an inequality, the limit is going to preserve that inequality, assuming limits exist. So I can say the limit as x goes to a of f of x should be less than or equal to the limit as x goes to a of g of x should be less than or equal to the limit as x goes to a of h of x if all of these limits exist. And then the second condition that I need to have is that two of these limits do need to exist and be a finite number. Now, this would actually work. If f and h were both going off to infinity and g was in between them, it would be going off to infinity too. But the theorem applies to finite limits. Okay, So that's saying that this thing does exist, and it's L. And this thing does exist, and it's L. Okay. So that would mean that the limit as x goes to a of g of x, if it exists, has to be in between L and L. Okay. And the conclusion is that the limit of the middle function does exist and that it actually is the same. Okay. So what we suppose is that we have this relationship between the three functions, a smaller one, one in the middle, and a bigger one. Then we also have to know that the limits of the smaller one and the bigger one are the same. So the smaller one and the bigger one are going to the same place. The conclusion is that the limit of the middle one not only exists, but is the same as the ones on either end. Okay. And that kind of makes some sense. If this is always in between these two things and they're going to the same place, it's gonna, if it stays in between them, it's going to be going to that same place as well. So that's what the squeeze theorem says. I want to use it in an example to evaluate a limit to see why it is that we might need this theorem. I think it kind of makes sense, but why would we ever use it if we've got all these other techniques? And there are some times when we do need to explicitly rely on the squeeze theorem. I'm just going to point out before I erase the theorem, it's an if-then. Remember, the way that we use an if-then is we have to show that the hypotheses are satisfied. And there are two hypotheses. So I'm going to have to show that there's this relationship. I'm going to have to establish an inequality. 
then I'm going to have to show that this second condition is satisfied, that the smallest function and the biggest function have the same finite limit. Okay. Once I've done that, then I can say, hey, by the squeeze theorem, I know that my conclusion, this result, is true. So if you are using the squeeze theorem to evaluate a limit, your write-up needs to include those three things. Demonstrating that the two hypotheses, the two if parts, are true. And then stating your conclusion. All right. So how would we need to use this? Let's suppose I want to evaluate the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times sine of 1 over x. Now, I know I cannot simply plug in 0 because 1 over x is not defined at 0. So even though this function is continuous on its domain, 0 is not in the domain. So I can't just plug in. Okay. But the problem here is, this is a product of two things. The limit of that piece is 0, but this piece, the limit actually doesn't exist, right? Because as x goes to 0, 1 over x is going to be going off to either plus or minus infinity. And what does sine do as we go off to plus or minus infinity? It just oscillates. It keeps oscillating between positive and negative 1. It's not approaching any one number, okay? And sometimes it's tempting to say, well, that goes to zero, so the whole thing must go to zero. Zero times any finite number is zero. Zero times something non-existent is not defined. So I can't simply evaluate the limit of each piece, okay? And the other techniques that we have generally involved if we had an indeterminate form where we had the top and the bottom both going to zero, sometimes we could factor and cancel, sometimes we could rationalize and cancel. I don't see that happening. This is factored into two separate pieces right now, but the limit of one piece doesn't exist, and it's not a fraction where I can cancel some things. But my problem piece is this piece right here. When I have a limit that looks difficult to evaluate, but the problem piece is a sine or a cosine, that's nice. Because sine and cosine are bounded. I know that no matter what I plug into sine, it always gives me something between negative 1 and 1. That's the range of sine. It can't give me anything bigger than 1 or smaller than negative 1. So that gives me an inequality that describes just the problem piece. What I'm hoping I can do is manipulate that inequality to get to an inequality where this problem function is in between two other functions, because that's what I need for the squeeze theorem. So if I look, what I want is a factor of x squared there. So I'm going to multiply through by x squared. Now, it is rather important that that's x squared because I know that x squared is never negative. It is 0 at 0, but I'm really just looking for an inequality that's true near 0. At 0, I know this thing isn't even defined. Okay, So if x is any number other than 0, I'm multiplying through by something positive, and that preserves inequalities. I do need to be careful if I'm multiplying an inequality by a variable because remember, if you multiply by something positive, it preserves the inequality. If you multiply by something negative, it reverses the inequality. So, very nice that we're multiplying here by x squared. So I would get negative x squared is less than or equal to x squared times sine of 1 over x, less than or equal to x squared. Excellent! That's exactly what I want. Remember, we said we needed three things. We needed to show that our two hypotheses, the two conditions in the if part of the squeeze theorem, were satisfied. This is the first one. My function is trapped in between two other functions. Okay. Now, it's not necessary that you number things, but I'm sort of mentally doing a checklist. I know there are three parts to the theorem, two hypotheses that I need to show are satisfied, 
and then I have to state my conclusion. So I'm at least mentally creating a checklist. If you find it helpful to actually number things, I'm okay with that, but it's certainly not a necessary part of your write-up. Okay. So then the other thing I need to do is I need to look at the limit of this function and this function. But isn't it convenient that they're so nice? Okay. So the limit as x goes to 0 of negative x squared is just negative 0 squared is just 0. And the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared is just 0 squared is just 0. And those are the same. So that was what I needed. Both of these limits had to exist as finite numbers, and they had to be the same. Mentally, I'm saying, okay, I've checked off the second if part. So both of those are satisfied. So, fabulous. Now, I know that the conclusion of the squeeze theorem holds. Don't forget to state it, okay? This isn't what I was trying to show. What I was trying to do is evaluate this. So now I'm going to say by the squeeze theorem, I know that the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared sine 1 over x is also 0. And that's a limit that I don't think we would have been able to evaluate without using this theorem. So it really is helpful to have that. Okay, I will just mention the squeeze theorem is stated for two-sided limits. It actually applies as well for one-sided limits. So it applies for limits from the left and limits from the right. In the next video, I'm going to have you work through an example with that. Before I have you try one of these on your own, I just want to take a graphical look at what just happened. So we were trying to evaluate the limit of this function, and we had trapped it in between these two functions. Now, I've just graphed those here. y equals x squared, that's my bigger function, that's this parabola that opens up y equals negative x squared, that's my smaller function, that's this parabola that opens down. And this inequality tells us that the graph of this function has to be in the region in between those two functions. And I can actually get some sense of what this looks like. I know the sine function is just oscillating. Okay. When I multiply sine by x squared, instead of it oscillating between a high value of 1 and a low value of negative 1, now, we're stretching or shrinking those oscillations so that it's bouncing back and forth between values on x squared and values on negative x squared. Making the input 1 over x, we've seen what that does as well, that changes how wide the oscillations are. So instead of the oscillations being evenly spaced, they get smushed together so that we're oscillating a lot faster as we get closer to the origin. So my function is basically oscillating between these two functions, and the oscillations start getting closer and closer together in two ways. They get smushed horizontally because of this 1 over x, but notice x squared and negative x squared are getting closer and closer and closer together. So this function, which has all this wiggle room over here, has very little room in which to play as we get closer and closer to zero. And you can see why this is called the squeeze theorem, because it's getting squeezed in between. If these two functions actually meet at zero, then it's got to be approaching zero as we get closer and closer and closer to zero.